Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Enabling Backup and Recovery Best Practices in 2021. This special event is presented in partnership with Rubrik. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be serving as your moderator for this webinar. Uh, this is going to be a really fun conversation style uh, event here today. We want this to be educational. We want to help get all your questions answered. Uh, I know that uh, data protection, uh, disaster recovery, ransomware, these are all hot topics for 2021. And that's why this event is just so critical. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, this is going to be a great a chat about backup and recovery in 2021, specifically around best practices. We encourage you to use the questions box. It's there in your audience console. Uh, if you click on questions, we'll be doing a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. So get your questions in early. Uh, we also have a best question prize, $50 for the best question on the event today. So hopefully that helps uh, to encourage you if you have a question around data protection, DR, best practices, uh, ask away. We also have a number of handouts, some resources there in the handouts tab. Uh, we've got a link to rubric.com as well as the rubric build website, which we'll be talking about later in the event. I encourage you to check those out. Uh, we also will be announcing the winner of an Amazon $300 gift card at the end of the event. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, of course, the drawing has already occurred. Price terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab. And with that, that's what you need to know about the event today. It's now time to introduce you to our expert presenter. I'm excited to introduce you to Mr. Rich Brumpton, channel, channel sales engineer at Rubrik. Rich, are you there? I sure am, David. Thanks a lot for the introduction and the time today to talk with your listeners about um, some backup uh, and recovery best practices in 2021. Uh, this is a year where uh, obviously we've seen a lot of change over the last 12 to 18 months, and a lot of folks have started to look at their environments, and uh, according to Gartner, 60% of companies are looking to change what they're doing around data protection. Um, we're going to talk about some of the things that are driving that and uh, why that's so important to pay attention to in your IT infrastructure today. So it, it's a new year, but we have the same problems we've had for quite some time. Um, we've got all these things going on with data growth, application sprawl, just tons and tons of data in more and more locations and applications running in more locations and ways than we've ever had before. We also have the extreme uptick that we've seen over the last year or so with ransomware attacks, which was already a big threat, but uh, it's gotten even worse. And Underlying all of this, we've got a ton of manual processes that people are going through in order to secure their environments, uh, make sure that they have all of their data protected properly, they've got the right data in the right places so that they can meet their compliance requirements. There's a lot going on with data management beyond just the data protection, but making sure that that data is safe, secure, and where it's supposed to be. So what this leads to is that data management is really inefficient. It's difficult to actually make sure that that stuff's where it's supposed to be, make sure that it's protected easily. There's tons of jobs and effort that you have to go through uh, in order to make sure that your data is backed up with most uh, uh, solutions out there today. Um, and we've done some things to help with that that we'll talk about throughout the, uh, the session today. Um, obviously, with a lot of effort comes a lot of strain on IT resources. Um, even if you're working from home, there's still even more things that are put on your plate than you ever anticipated um, coming down the pipe all the time that IT has to deal with. So anything we can do to kind of relieve some of that strain is a huge thing to pay attention to. Um, and then, of course, the business itself is vulnerable. When we start talking about risks like data loss or ransomware, uh, those can be huge. We can be talking a million dollars an hour or more for uh, the cost to the business of having a, a critical application or platform go out. So some things when we talk to customers that we hear them say is they really have three main areas that they're looking to innovate in. Um, they wanna modernize and automate. Uh, they, they wanna take a lot of those manual processes and turn them into repeatable things that they can um, play over and over again with a low risk as opposed to having to um, have people manually walk their way through documents, potentially making mistakes when they're provisioning new services, when they're dealing with scenarios, um, fixing issues, et cetera. 
Um, there's also still a huge drive to a multi and hybrid cloud world. 70% uh, of CIOs have a, a top level initiative to go cloud first on their platforms. It's a big drive. A lot of organizations are still trying to figure out how to make that transition and when to make that transition for various parts of their IT organization. Um, there's also, like I mentioned, ransomware and other risks out there, including insider threats. So we have to make sure that we can mitigate that data risk and kind of build that defense in depth strategy that allows you to try to prevent things up front, but also be able to recover on the back end should the worst happen. So what we're going to cover over the next few minutes are five key best practices to evolve your data protection strategy. And these best practices are something just to, to keep in mind as you're going through and reviewing how I'm protecting my data today, what am I doing in order to make sure that things are in the right place, they're protected with the right policy, they're going to meet my compliance requirements, et cetera. So the first one is to look at your infrastructure and see where you have opportunities to modernize. Uh, this is something that uh, might be hardware. Maybe you've got out-of-date platforms that you need to replace or, so or hardware that's going uh, into its fourth, fifth, or maybe later year of uh, life, cycle, life cycle support, and it's becoming really expensive to uh, maintain that stuff. Um, it may also be software, um, something that you've been relying on for years, but uh, may have uh, recently given you an unexpected security risk, like we've discovered recently was the solar winds issue. Um, maybe it's a utility that's used for departmental purpose, or it's a software platform like the one you use for data protection that was architected in the 90s. So that's something to think about as you're looking at your infrastructure. So, uh, David, when we're talking about modernizing infrastructure, what are some questions that come to mind for you? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of questions. Um, being a former IT manager myself, I know how tough it can be to keep your infrastructure modern and up to date. Uh, so first one I wanted to ask you is, you know, does this always mean that we have to buy new hardware? No, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to buy new hardware. Sometimes it makes sense. Like I mentioned, things going out of support becoming too expensive to, uh, to maintain support contracts on. It totally makes sense to get out of those uh, scenarios to, to avoid uh, having to ever do one of those lift and shift replacements again. Um, other places, I mean, everything's virtualized to a large degree. 90 plus percent of the workloads that we protect for customers are virtualized. So there's a lot of opportunity there to start utilizing new ways of managing your infrastructure and modernizing at the software level, getting to the latest revision of code, uh, getting practices out there like using tags in your VMware environment as opposed to just using a more static folder structure, being able to do some more dynamic things um, because you've got those hooks now that you can go and, and cross section and find all the SQL servers across all the folders in your data center, et cetera. Yeah, great points. Great points. I like that. Uh, good ideas. And then another question here kind of related to that. I mean, I've worked in a shop before where the executives or the CIO kind of have the mantra of, we're just going to use whatever we bought, you know, until it absolutely dies. Uh, do you have any tips for, you know, IT pros that work in those kind of shops with that kind of mantra? Yeah. Uh, my first one is to identify those things that are walking around that are already dead. Um, I, I run into organizations that have what I call zombie software or zombie hardware that it it's walking around, but it's not really serving a purpose anymore. It's or it's not serving the purpose that it needs to. Um, it's slow. It's causing more trouble than it's worth. You're having to 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 worry about how you're going to defend yourself against the problems that it's causing more than um, the the benefits that it's bringing the organization. And those things are a great opportunity to modernize. Um, so something that we're often helping customers with is taking a, an antiquated system where they're having to manually schedule every single thing and if somebody turns on DRS in the VMware environment and shuffles the VMs around, it just blows their schedule and they have to redo all sorts of manual tasks to, to get things back on track. Those types of software can be a, a big target to, to help uh, reduce that, um, that, uh, uh, that, that presence of zombie software, since I've coined the term now on your show, David, um, <laughs> in, your, in your organization. Um, you also have a lot of opportunity, again, because things are virtualized, especially for hardware platforms, yes, as long as it makes sense to extend support or, or support it yourself, move it to a lab environment or something. Um, I know every one of us would probably like to have more equipment available for the lab environment. So there's a lot of good things you can do on the hardware side as well. 
Okay, excellent tips. And I know one of the most compelling things that you know any IT pro can do to help uh, motivate the executives or the the CIO perhaps is to share some kind of success story. Can you tell us about any stories where a customer has modernized their infrastructure and this has really paid off for them? Yeah, we actually have a lot of customers that have uh, gotten some real benefits that are tangible to the IT professionals actually performing the work in time savings. Um, we have a customer we'll be bringing up on the screen a little later in the presentation called Seattle Genomics, which had a 70% time savings in the amount of time they were spending doing care and feeding around their data protection platform. Um, another one of our customers, uh, the uh, Formula One uh, AMG Patronus team, um, has actually achieved a 90% savings. So I mean, we see customers saving a lot of time. And then more importantly, for the guys that are writing the checks, we uh, looking at all the different components that are involved in a data protection platform, we can help them save money as well. So it might even be something that can justify a, a, a switch to rubric before the uh, life cycle of the equipment comes up, for instance, and we can help figure out where that makes sense for our customers. Excellent. Yeah, I look forward to those stories. Uh, so with that, let's move on uh, to tip number two. Tell us about it, Rich. All right. Yeah, so the, the next tip, of course, is to make sure that you secure your data and infrastructure. And this obviously is something that we've all been doing for years and paying attention to security. But after the year that we've just had with the increased ransomware attacks and other threats, um, I, I think it pays us. It pays off to to kind of double down on this and say, okay, where haven't I been thinking about security? Is my, for instance, data protection platform? Since we're talking about data protection today, is my data protection platform actually architected to be secure, or do I have to like configure security controls and encryption on several different systems that are all tied together and make sure that all my user permissions are in line and I'm dealing with RBAC on multiple platforms? Is that really something that's going to uh, give me a secure environment and, and, and help me protect that data? Or would it be better to actually look at another solution that has uh, an immutable file system underneath the covers that is not vulnerable to ransomware, that has uh, a single vertical integration of all the different components of the data uh, uh, protection infrastructure? So there's only one set of things to secure as opposed to a whole bunch of sets of things to secure. Um, so that's a, a big focus for us is helping our customers by really reducing that that uh, that uh, footprint of what's available for people to get a handle on in order to attack their data protection infrastructure. Because once uh, something comes into your environment, it often attacks your data protection infrastructure and then goes after the rest of your data so that you don't have anything to fall back on, especially, again, the ransomware threat. So, uh, David, uh, what are some thoughts you have on this one? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is just, like you said, such a hot topic for 2021. This is an area I believe everybody needs to be working on in some way uh, this year. So, I mean, first question c comes to mind is how do we know that it's really secure? So that's a great question because you have to be able to trust this. This is the it's kind of the last resort of where you go to get your data in the event of all other ways of getting your data back fail, right? So um, super important. We've actually had our uh, immutable file system verified by third parties. We help our customers understand the zero trust model, the fact that we use digital certificates everywhere, that we have a good RBAC uh, role-based access control system that allows customers to assign just the right access to the right people um, and, and get through that process to really have a deep understanding of our, our security. And we also have a security best practices and hardening guide uh, which can help customers take that to the next level and make sure they've ticked all the boxes in the adjacent infrastructure uh, as well. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds like a great resource uh, that a lot of folks should check out over at rubric.com. Um, and then what about if my local data is compromised, say this, there's a ransomware attack, uh, how, what's the best practice around you know, making sure data is offsite? Yeah, so uh, the, the traditional way of, of putting data offsite on tapes was great for like making sure that you had a copy of the tape uh, of the of the data and it was offsite, right? The the problem comes when it's okay, I've lost data at my primary site and I need to get it back. 
So now I have to call the guy with the truck to go out to the salt mine and retrieve my tape and bring it back to the data center and get it into the system and start spooling that data back into my environment at the uh, the wicked fast speed that tape provides, right? I mean, it's not a quick process for recovery, which is the real downfall of those types of uh, scenarios for protecting your data and getting it offsite. So what we have is first off, we're gonna keep that uh, local copy of that data safe with an immutable file system. Uh, we can turn on a retention lock to make sure that it can't be deleted even by an administrator uh, without uh, uh, without like sign off from your your officers in your company level, um, and then we also offer the opportunity to archive that to cloud storage or non premises object storage for another copy of the data, and also the ability to replicate to a disaster recovery site where you have another rubric appliance that can also be used to do rapid recovery. Um, and when it comes to recovery, we actually have this cool technology called Live Mount. And what it does is it allows you to mount up and use that data immediately from the rubric appliance and then do a storage v motion or similar migration back to your production storage. So if it's a VM, a SQL database, an Oracle database, a Windows volume, it's super easy to get that stuff back, start using it right away, and then get it onto the high performing flash array or something as you can as you're doing your recovery. So um, really big focus at Rubrik on getting data back quickly as well as protecting it in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, that's the reason we're backing up in the first place is so that we can recover. But too often, that's kind of the forgotten part. Um, it's like, yep, the backups are good, uh, but did we actually test the recovery? And I know in ransomware attacks, that's just so critical, especially being able to do kind of a mass recovery, you know, all at one time, because you're not going to restore just one file or one machine you may need to restore everything. So uh, that is that is critical. Um, here's a question that came in there asking, uh, what type of encryption uh, does Rubrik offer for storing that this data at rest? So we use AES-256 uh, for all the data at rest. We uh, have software encryption on every appliance that we sell um, that is on by default. And we also have the option if you need to have a FIPS compliant appliance, we've got two different models that you can choose from that have hardware level encryption uh, for FIPS 140-2. Very nice. And then what about compliance reporting? What does Rubrik offer around that? So we've got a couple different levels of this. We have the, uh, we have the core concept that we'll talk a little bit deeper about called an SLA, a service level agreement that we uh, use to set our data protection policy. And that actually we can report on and make sure that all of your workloads are being protected according to that policy, which is very well aligned with the business policy around RTO and RPO. Uh, not as much lots and lots of details, more that broad strokes of how often I need to protect something and how long I want to retain that protection for. Um, so uh, in addition to being able to report on whether we're compliant or not with that, uh, we also have another product called Sonar that's part of our Sol uh, Polaris SaaS platform, which actually allows us to go a level deeper and help you inspect your data and see where sensitive data resides. So you can understand where there's credit card data, PII, and we have, again, pre-built policies that are super easy to use around things like GDPR, CCPA, um, uh, PCI DSS. So you can apply those policies as they make sense and find out, hey, there's social security numbers sitting on an FTP site that somebody left there seven years ago and, and have been sitting open to the public. Um, these types of things happen and we can help customers discover those without putting additional burden on their uh, production systems by taking advantage of that secondary copy of the data that we have and helping customers do more with their data. Yeah, that's absolutely critical is getting that kind of insight into what the data is, what what part of the data is uh, needs to be, you know, secured more than other parts, because I'm sure, you know, if we don't know it, the, the attackers will find out um, and maybe we didn't protect it as, as good as we had, or should have done. So it uh, sounds like some really valuable tools there. And then I know that Rubrik is big on automation. So how can Rubrik help to automate this security we're talking about? Yeah, so everything we do uh, stems from that service level agreement, SLA domain that we have that allows you to set a policy on a workload. Now, everything that we do um, has an API behind it. We have a really easy to use RESTful API that we'll talk about a little bit deeper as we go on in the presentation. But 
everything that we can do in the GUI, you can do via scripting. Uh, and we have pre-built SDKs for Python, for PowerShell, for Ruby, a bunch of other tools um, that uh, I believe, David, you have a link to, to build.rubric.com included on here. So there's a ton of great information there that uh, people can look at for how to automate uh, both the protecting of the data and also potentially doing uh, recoveries of the data. Um, we actually just introduced a new uh, feature in 5.3 uh, which is our latest release that just came down at the end of the year. And it allows you to do backup validation via our API by triggering the rubric appliance to live mount virtual machines on uh, a VMware environment, validate that we can get access to that uh, virtual machine and then tear it down again in an automated fashion and give you a report to prove that, yes, I can recover all of this data. Wow, that's really cool. I didn't, I didn't know about that. So exciting new features. Uh, being announced here or being talked about here. So um, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, yeah, I know because the security, if it's manual, it's it's not going to happen, right? It's got to be automated. So um, great point on that. So let's move on now. Let's talk about expanding uh, to hybrid and multi-cloud because this is also a hot topic for 2021. Yeah, definitely. Like I mentioned, uh, there's a ton of C, uh, CIOs who have an initiative to go cloud first and figure out where they can leverage cloud for their environments and, and where it's the right choice to go. Um, so there, there's a few different ways that you can look at cloud. Um, some people look at it as where the workload's running. Other folks uh, realize that there's more involved with the way that data is managed here. And we've built a platform that allows customers to protect their on-premises workloads, to protect workloads running in the cloud, and also help migrate those to the cloud um, as well. So we've got a, a great set of tools to help with this expansion across these different, uh, different locations and these different styles of managing data. So uh, David, uh, when we're talking about hybrid cloud, what's something that comes to mind for you? Well, first off, just around cloud. I mean, there's so many definitions when we talk about hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, and I think it's easy to get confused. So why don't you first start off with just a definition? What does that mean to you? Yeah, so so to me and to Rubrik, we have uh, the, the, the definition of a hybrid cloud is really where you have some things which you're managing as traditional infrastructure and or on-premises. Uh, maybe it's in a colo, but you're still managing in a more traditional mode. Um, you also have some workloads that you're either running on-prem as a private cloud or you're running in a public cloud. Um, and that multi-cloud thing happens, honestly, to a lot of organizations, whether they like it or not, because it turns out that, the, uh, that one department has a real affinity for the way that AWS does things. Another really loves all the analytical capabilities that Google Cloud brings. And then you also have a Microsoft ELA that gives you tons of free Azure credit. Um, so. The, the, the kind of the hybridization and the, the, the multitude of places and ways to run your data is just expanding all the time. So it's, it's not just a matter of one plus one anymore. It's often a matter of uh, one plus two or three. Got it. Okay. And then when it comes to multi-cloud, you make a great point there that a lot of IT organizations, uh, they didn't really choose to do multi-cloud. They, they kind of had to do multi-cloud, but uh, are there organizations that are choosing to do multi-cloud for one reason or another? Yeah, there are definitely folks uh, that we work with that that take advantage of the fact that we can protect data in one cloud and restore it into another as kind of a, a protection against lock-in. So if they're running a whole bunch of SQL databases on one cloud and they decide they want to move them to a different cloud, it's just a matter of replicating them over there and then bringing them online in the other cloud and they could potentially spin down those services. Don't see a lot of customers doing that like on a day-to-day -day or week-by-week -week basis, but as an insurance policy, uh, it's, it's a really good tool to have in your tool belt. And it's also a great negotiating tool come renewal time or contract negotiation time with the cloud vendors. Once you get to the point where you're running a lot of workloads in the cloud, there's a lot of discounts to be had if you have yourself a really good, strong bargaining position. And a key piece to managing this stuff is also to keep that multi-cloud thing simple. Um, so have one set of tools for data protection that works across a broad variety of, of cloud locations as well as your on-premises location, and you're going to be in a much better place than if you have a whole bunch of point tools that you have to manage. Great point. Yeah, it's, it's really cool to know that Rubrik can, can kind of make cloud 
into what it should be <laughs> by making these these workloads portable and allowing you to better you know negotiate and save money uh, on your cloud spend because I think that's a big question for a lot of folks is um, you know how do I know if if cloud is right for me and a lot of that comes back to the cost um, so do you have any tips around that you know knowing if cloud is is going to be a smart financial decision. So we help a lot of customers with kind of their first toehold in the cloud using the the concept of replacing uh, on-site tape libraries with archiving to the cloud. It's a great first use case because we can actually look at your data growth rates and what's going on in your environment and with your data and help you forecast that to a really good degree so that you can understand what the costs are going to be around that. Then as you get more mature, you start wanting to do more workloads in the cloud. We offer the ability to actually take that data and uh, do what we call a cloud on, where you turn that uh, data that you've archived into the cloud into a native virtual machine, and you can start doing testing, uh, maybe do some test dev activities out there, um, some DR uh, uh, readiness activities, et cetera, as opposed to having to do them maybe at a, an on-site uh, data center, um, and, and really uh, kind of step into cloud as a journey. It really is a journey, and you have to understand that the the, um, the way that your applications work and the way that your people work as they start expanding into the cloud. Otherwise, yeah, we've all heard the wonderful horror stories of the developer who gets the boss's credit card and, and, uh, and runs it up. So we want to help our customers prevent that with some nice, easy steps to, to move into the cloud. Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds very, very helpful. I mean, because cost is one aspect, but you're right, getting that kind of comfort level uh, and, and, knowledge and, and uh, wisdom around how the whole cloud uh, solution works and especially around your applications uh, because they're going to be different at, at every company. And like you said, that first use case of just running disaster recovery, your data protection in the cloud sounds like a great place for a lot of companies to get started. So let's now move on and talk about uh, next topic, preparing for new workloads and applications. So this is one that, again, this may be uh, something that you've already been thinking about, but uh, the, the last year has really helped us understand how quickly it can happen that all of a sudden you're using a new application in production. We've had a ton of organizations that we work with completely change the way that they're doing some of their business. Um, those of you who've paid attention to Microsoft 365 uh, probably noticed that they had to limit some of their services in March and April of last year because uh, they, they had such a rapid adoption, like 700% growth all of a sudden, because uh, lots of people needed to work from home and it was a great way to uh, suddenly pivot from using on-site applications for email and collaboration to using uh, cloud-based applications. So it, things can change really quickly out there. So you need to be prepared. You need to be looking at platforms that can back up things like Microsoft 365 that can back up workloads running in the cloud as well as workloads running on-premises uh, to back up next generation uh, things like NoSQL. Um, so it's it's really important to pay attention to where it's possible that you'll go and make sure that you're ready to uh, take on those new workloads and apps when they appear uh, because they often appear out of the executive suite um, or out of a business need. And then IT has to figure out how to handle those and handle them well really quickly so that they don't become a big uh, burden on them. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, as an IT manager, so many times, unfortunately, uh, there was always the business leader that walked in and said, hey, we bought this application. Can you get this going for us? Uh, so you didn't always have time to really learn about and analyze you know, all the requirements and make sure your infrastructure and, and software management, everything was ready for that. Um, so we in IT, we need to be ready. Uh, and we also need to be, of course, involved in the business to, to try to make sure that that type of thing doesn't happen if possible. Um, but always be prepared. So what does Rubrik support around running new workloads these days? Yeah, so uh, the, the key ones that we're talking to customers a lot about, I mentioned before, Microsoft 365. Uh, we currently support uh, Mail and OneDrive. We have uh, upcoming support in beta for SharePoint and Teams uh, specific support. So we'll actually be capturing that important metadata around Teams in addition to just the, the SharePoint level data. Um, and then we're also looking at other workloads that customers are shifting to the cloud. For instance, uh, SAP is a great example. Um, the, the database that 
people used to run SAP on is being deprecated. Now SAP's got its new in-memory database, HANA. Um, and as part of the adoption of that HANA product, we found that a ton of customers are, are coupling that to a migration to the cloud. Um, so GCP or other clouds uh, are hosting HANA for customers and uh, we're, we're focusing on how to handle those for them. Um, and then I also mentioned uh, next generation databases like MongoDB, Cassandra, uh, NoSQL products um, are, are key for us. And then we also have uh, things like Oracle, SQL Server, um, uh, AWS RDS and virtual machines running in the cloud that are all, I mean, they're not necessarily applications in the traditional sense, but if you think about it, consuming a virtual machine in the cloud is a lot more application-like than it's ever been like in the past. Absolutely. Yeah, great points. Um, and I'm sure there's some IT folks out there saying, you know, hey, we may never get to new workloads. Are you going to support our old workloads too? Can Rubrik protect the more legacy applications? Yeah, definitely. I, and I mean, we cut our teeth on the VMware environments, backing up Exchange and SharePoint on-premises, if that's someplace that you're going to be for a while, um, backing up uh, Linux, uh, physical or virtual, SQL, Oracle. And then we also have a technology uh, called uh, the Elastic App Service, uh, which basically allows us to present a volume that's available for applications to write data on. And you can write a script or use a, an automation that we have to basically start a snapshot process, have your application dump data into Rubrik, and then stop the snapshot process. And at that point, it becomes an immutable snapshot that Rubrik uh, retains for you according to an SLA. Uh, it's just like anything else that we protect. So a lot of applications we may never have never seen we can support uh, in your legacy environment. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, we, I know a lot of companies still need that that flexibility. Um, so let's now move on and talk about tip number five on the best practice list, Rich. Yeah, number five is one of my favorites. Uh, automate IT processes. Uh, my, one of my previous uh, uh, things that I did in a previous life was to actually help a company uh, take a legacy medical uh, imaging and planning app uh, and move it up into the cloud and then deploy it out to 25 new locations over the course of two years. This would have been absolutely impossible if I'd actually been clicking through wizards and having people trained in order to be able to click through wizards and, and do things manually in order to set up this application. But through the power of automation, we actually took what used to be a two-day process down to about five hours and nobody had to pay attention to it unless something went wrong during that five hours. So it was really a fire and forget process to stand up a new site in a new country and start being able to service customers there. It was a massive acceleration to their business. This is also a great way to uh, take error prone tasks and reduce risk in those tasks. And uh, it, it can also be a way to integrate with other things. For instance, um, just about everybody has heard of ServiceNow. A lot of you are probably using it. There is a ton of capability in ServiceNow to be able to hook into other products and integrate with those. And we have some awesome integrations that allow you to say, when you're deploying a new virtual machine, assign an SLA domain to it so that you know it's protected with gold, silver, bronze, or whatever policy it needs to be protected with. Um, maybe uh, you want to allow developers to do their own um, on-demand SQL database mounts. Uh, that's something that they could do through the ServiceNow interface, and you don't necessarily have to have a help desk. We even have a self-service file restore capability uh, in that ServiceNow uh, 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 integration. So a lot of things that you can bring to the surface that aren't necessarily like written by hand automation, they could be integrations between different products. So, uh, David, uh, what what are some thoughts you have about automation outside of what I mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first question that comes to mind is for a lot of IT pros who haven't done much scripting or developing before, automation might sound hard. So what do they need to know if they're not a developer? So if you're not a developer, we actually have a really cool tool for you to understand our APIs, we have this API Explorer built into our platform. You just go to uh, one of uh, the rubric nodes with a, a different path on the end of it. It gets you a list of all the APIs that are available. And from right there, you can actually play around with them. Um, like I mentioned, there's also the fact that we do integration. So if you want to integrate with Splunk, you want to integrate with ServiceNow, 
integrate with um, uh, other platforms. We've got a lot of those integrations pre-built. Uh, we've mentioned build.rubric.com. There's uh, something like 70 GitHub repositories hiding behind build.rubric.com. So a lot of cool stuff out there that you can take a look at and uh, get ideas and starting points. And of course, um, I have uh, a, a friend of mine who has said, there's no, it, it seems that since the internet, nobody has written a script. It's been copied and pasted around the internet and we've all shared a little bit of it. So um, there, there's a lot of great resources out there for you. So if you have just a little bit of scripting expertise, you know some PowerShell, you know a little bit of Python, it's super easy to get in and start using it. Um, to, to actually, to that point, another big thing that we have in our favor is because we've done a lot of the automation underneath the covers with our SLA domains, the fact that we automatically schedule things for you, et cetera. We have a lot fewer things that you have to touch on our system in order to do automation. So where some platforms you might have to do 20 or 30 steps in order to define all the things you need to in order to protect a workload or recover a workload, um, on our platform, it's more like two or three steps. So it's a lot easier to, to get in there and actually get something done that's worthwhile without building a ton of error checking or other things. Very nice. Yeah, I'm over here on build.rubric.com. I see you know, so many integrations, An uh, Ansible, v VMware vRealize, uh, Terraform, uh, so many more, Splunk, uh, Prometheus, uh, Red Hat, uh, all kinds of integrations. And then like you mentioned, uh, SDKs for Go and PowerShell and Python, a uh, lot of uh, chatbots, a lot of cool stuff out here. So I encourage everyone to check that out. It's in the handouts tab. And then uh, let's see, next question I want to ask you is, can you give us some examples about how automation has really changed the life of real IT pros out there, Rich? Yeah, so um, this this is something that has been a huge benefit for some of our customers, a, a, a lot of them. It's the easy button around something like the ServiceNow integration, being able to um, uh, give the, maybe not the end users, but give your frontline help desk the ability to do uh, automation to recover files through ServiceNow as opposed to um, actually having to pass a ticket over to the, the poor data protection guy who's overworked and already trying to figure out what went wrong with his legacy product. And now he has to go in and find data for somebody and get it back and hope it's the right version. So a lot of it rotates just around that little core of being able to do the, the job of data protection and recovery more easily. Um, we do have uh, customers that have gone further than that. Um, one of our customers has uh, 2,200 sites and they these branch offices all have data that they need protected. So they have 2,200 appliances, virtual appliances in this case, uh, running across that environment to make sure that that data is protected. Using our APIs and our uh, and PowerShell, they're able to actually make changes on all 2,200 of those as if they're one big fabric. So it's a, it's a super easy way for them to kind of have a force multiplier that uh, allows them to manage this very large number of sites as a, a single large object. So a lot of cool things that you can do with uh, the automation side of things. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea of automating, uh, making IT, profo IT pros into, you know, kind of the superhero of the business and making us so much, much more efficient so that we can focus on the needs of the business. But, but Tell us about some of the end results for actually the business itself, like at a higher level. So at a higher level, um, a lot of times what you find is once, once you start automating processes, you can start focusing more on bringing business value. So helping to uh, work on those projects that haven't been uh, done in a long time because there was no time to do them, uh, being able to actually uh, be more agile and able to pivot processes to suit business needs as they change. For instance, last year, as everything went uh, home and we had to change a whole lot of processes, uh, companies that were already uh, working on more automated systems were able to pivot more quickly uh, by changing kind of that code that runs their infrastructure. Um, and then of course, the other big thing is it reduces the cost of those just day-to-day -day operations massively because now they're in code and maybe they require a little maintenance, but they don't require somebody clicking through an interface every day. And that means there's more productive hours available to uh, actually get the projects that bring value to the business done, as opposed to just keeping the lights on, kind of helping flip that 80-20 triangle upside down a little bit. 
Very cool. I like that. Yeah, that could help so many companies out there. So thank you for sharing all the automation tips with us. Uh, and with that, why don't you tell us more, you know, in detail about Rubrik? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, let's talk about what we do to enable uh, modern backup and recovery. And we're going to go really quickly here at a high level. We'll have some future opportunities for you guys to learn a lot more. Uh, but I, I just want to make sure you understand the high points of what we do. Uh, we got into this business because we looked around and we were like, everything out there today is architected in the 90s, very complex, sometimes earlier than the 90s. A um, lot of uh, issues with slow things, both in processes, like having to do full backups on occasion, as well as just things like tape that are inherently slow. Um, and there's also a lot of cost related to uh, kind of the legacy infrastructure that we saw out there in the market when we started up. So what we did is... Uh, we built a platform that really takes all of these uh, things that customers want and puts them all in one place. So all of the different workloads that they want to protect, we built ways to extend those to the cloud. I mentioned our cloud archiving capability, our ability to actually take those workloads and turn them on in the cloud. We built a lot of the automation into the platform. So automation isn't necessarily something that you're just doing yourself. It's also something that platforms and products can do for you. So our SLA, for instance, allows us to define how frequently we want to take a snapshot, say every hour for a day, every day for a week, every week for a month, every month for a year, and then keep that five years, something like that. And apply that simple policy to any type of workload, whether it's a virtual machine, a database, um, a, a NAS, a file set on a, a physical server or a virtual machine, it doesn't matter. We can take that same policy and reuse it across lots of things. And then our own intelligence will help actually make the the day-to-day the -day operation of when to back up each workload decision and back that stuff up for you and protect it in order to make sure that you have that SLA met. Um, we also focus, as I talked about earlier, with on rapid recovery. Get that data back as quickly as possible. Keep a copy on site. Keep a copy at your DR site. Uh, be able to uh, really have the assurance that should something go wrong, whether it's one of those big uh, disasters that we've been talking about, or even just the operational whoops, the I lost a file, I deleted the wrong VM, something went wrong with my database or my application, and I need to recover a table, those types of things that are super important, but a lot smaller than those big disasters, we also need to provide rapid recovery for those. Um, uh, giving you APIs for everything, and then also building on a very secure foundation for you with a zero trust model. So you don't have to worry about lots and lots of components that you have to secure separately. And then around mitigating data risk, we've built some additional tools in the last few years to help you with your cyber resilience strategy by actually looking at the data that's being protected and uh, seeing if there's a large anomaly that's happened to that data, like a whole bunch of data is missing or it looks like it's been encrypted and alerting you on that and giving you a three-step wizard to be able to recover that data extremely quickly, uh, a lot faster than you can uh, even figure out what data has changed for most products. Um, the data governance piece that I mentioned earlier uh, is a big one for our customers, being able to figure out where their sensitive data is so now they can narrow down their audits, uh, they can narrow down their scopes, um, et cetera. And then uh, being able to perform disaster recovery, obviously, should the worst happen, you need to be able to get your stuff back. So we built this all into one uh, next-gen cloud data management platform. And so th the way that we actually, actually modernize this protection, um, we help with automation. So this is a, a quick picture of what legacy infrastructures used to look like with lots of different components and pieces and parts, as I've been mentioning. Uh, even just wanting to do a software upgrade on one of these can be challenging because you have to look at all the different versions of software in a large matrix and all your hardware, firmware, et cetera, before you can actually execute on an upgrade. With us, we have a single platform that allows you to uh, manage everything in one place, upgrade in one place extremely easily. We also allow you to accelerate recovery. Um, so like I mentioned, rapid uh, our recovery time objectives, being able to, uh, uh, in a lot of environments, mount a virtual machine in 20 seconds or less, sometimes single digit number of seconds, mount a, uh, a SQL database or an Oracle database in a minute or two. And we've actually had customers who have tested multi-terabyte databases 
and gotten uh, sub three minute uh, restore times to be able to access the data in that database, which can be huge. That's faster than you can copy that database somewhere to even start thinking about mounting it. You might not be even be able to figure out where you're gonna send the data in three minutes. And then uh, also, of course, we talked about real benefits to the business before. Um, there's a lot of places you can save when you talk about modernizing your data protection infrastructure. Uh, the maintenance renewals, the uh, not needing to buy another frame because you're running out of space in your existing one, the, the lack of forklift upgrades. We never require you to do a forklift upgrade again. Um, less professional services. Um, dealing with the fact that your product may not be complete and it doesn't support this cloud, that cloud. Maybe it doesn't support my, uh, portability to the cloud at all. Um, and then helping you with those time consuming operations so we can really build a good uh, story around the bottom line as well. And this comes out to our customers that can be a 70 to 90% cost savings. A lot of our customers are somewhere in that 30 to 60% TCO savings overall, uh, depending on what the, all the different components are that we talk about when we're talking about that savings. So I, I mentioned Seattle Ge uh, Genetics earlier to, uh, in the session. Um, these guys actually managed to reduce their administrative time by 70%. So think about that. You were spending eight hours a day managing backups. Uh, now you're spending an hour and change. Uh, it's a huge difference. Um, and then the TCO was lowered by somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 50%. So they were able to actually justify this very easily as opposed to having to like compare two things that were very, very close to each other in cost. We're able to justify on that basis as well. We have customers like the University of California, San Diego, that have done awesome things to accelerate their cloud adoption. Uh, UC San Diego actually took and put 2,000 virtual machines into the cloud over the course of a weekend. Uh, we have the ability, because we're doing incremental forever data protection and we're sending that data up to the cloud incrementally, we can turn it on in the cloud once it gets there. We've got awesome capabilities to help customers actually perform that migration to the cloud as it makes sense to them and then protect those workloads once they get there. And then the last example I'm going to have today um, is uh, our city of Durham example. This is one that I really love because this is a, a city that had the worst thing you can imagine happen. They had ransomware come in and just trash their production systems. They had all sorts of things that they had to get back up and running. Um, there was challenges with the infrastructure in, in order to get it back, but uh, Rubric, the platform, and then Rubric, the company, we came together with them to help them perform their recovery, get their data back, get their systems back up and running with a really rapid recovery process for the, the level of impact this had on their organization. And then the coolest thing is, that this is actually documented in public record. There, there's video of the IT administrators explaining to the city council how Rubric was able to protect their data and help them with the recovery. So that you can actually Google City of Durham Rubric and uh, find that footage and be able to uh, see what a real customer says when they're talking to their bosses basically about, uh, about Rubric and, and how it was able to protect them. One more thing on that on that last one, um, on the mitigate risk side of things, there can be other bottom line impacts here. Uh, so I'm throwing one more in here uh, without uh, without warning to David. So if, bear with me just a moment. Um, we also had a customer who's an airline who uh, had a cyber insurance premium drop of a million dollars a year because they implemented our solution and were able to prove to their underwriter that uh, this was something that was going to mitigate a lot of risk they had in their environment. So there can be other impacts that you may not think of as you're talking about just the data protection solution, but because we're also bringing security and compliance benefits to the table, there may be a whole nother justification that we can bring along with it. All right, so with that, that's the end of my prepared section of things. I really appreciate everybody's time today. Our catchphrase is don't back up, go forward. Uh, so now we're gonna go forward into some Q&A. Excellent, great presentation, Rich. We do have some questions coming in, in for you uh, from the audience here. Uh, first one I wanted to ask you, and this one's from Amanda, who says that they have 
uh, 20 different systems kind of band-aided together. Um, could Rubrik possibly integrate and, and be able to protect data from so many different systems? Uh, that's unfortunately not an uncommon problem. So yes, um, we have the ability to, to back up virtual machines, physical machines, databases, et cetera. Um, I would be surprised if we couldn't um, back up all the pieces of your band-aided system and make sure that they're all available, uh, that you have the ability to recover those uh, in the, the, the event that you need to. Um, and then potentially we might be able to do something fun with making that data available in the cloud to, to do some testing around what you could do to maybe uh, do some integration testing or data migrations on the new platforms. So there could be some, some other interesting stuff we could do there too. Very nice. Very nice. Next question, uh, Mark's asking, um, do you offer immutable backups? Yes. Uh, so uh, talk, when we talk about immutable backups, it's important to, to talk about whether that's done internally on the platform or whether that comes from some other thing. Uh, we have seen some claims in the market about immutable backups that don't necessarily mean that the data that's stored by the backup software itself is immutable. That's the way we actually function. Our appliances have a file system that we wrote specifically to be immutable. It doesn't have the ability to modify the data in place. It always writes new data. As long as some data is protected by an SLA, it's our file system's sole mission in life to make sure that that data is accessible and it's protected against any uh, deletion. Um, and it's also never exposed to the network as a whole. We don't have an NFS mount or an SMB mount that some ransomware can even try to access in the first place. And even if we did, they can't actually modify the data on our platform anyway. So we're, we're kind of doubly, triply protected there. Excellent. Um, here's a question they're asking, what about pros and cons of a hybrid cloud? What's your take on, on the pluses and minuses? So it, it, there are obviously some minuses as you start talking about the additional complexity, but on the flip side, there could be some serious pluses. For instance, I mean, the, the, the strategy I executed in a previous life of deploying an application into 25 countries in the course of a two year period, the two years before that they had managed to half deploy it in one country, kind of the old fashioned way. So using those cloud style management techniques, you can uh, kind of, it feels a little bit like a superpower. You suddenly have the ability to affect a hundred virtual machines or a hundred databases, as opposed to having to touch each one yourself. So there are some definite benefits to that cloud style management, um, but that's something that you can honestly achieve with on-premises infrastructure as well. Um, v vSphere, for instance, you can manage that very much like a cloud uh, if you, if you kind of adopt that mindset. And then as you start using other clouds, you'll see, yeah, it's not that different. It's a lot easier to move into Azure, AWS, et cetera. Excellent. Um, next question. Uh, let's see, there's a lot of different uh, questions coming in here. I like this one. Uh, what really makes Rubrik different from the other data protection and DR tools out, out there in the industry? That's a great question. So we've been talking a lot about security. We really think we have that on lock and uh, we've got a story there that can't be beat. Outside of that, um, we've also been focused on simplicity. It's probably the biggest thing you'll see when you, when you look at Rubrik and you touch our software, um, you're going to see that it's super easy to define a policy for how you want to protect something apply that policy to things, and then be able to recover them and report on the fact that they were protected uh, properly. Way simpler than most uh, software because we did think ahead about this data protection, data management, um, uh, data fabric view of the world. And we really focused on making it easy for our customers by pre-automating a lot of things. I love that. Yeah. Pre-automation, uh, security, efficiency, great points. The next question Chad is asking, does Rubrik have an on-premises solution if an organization is not ready to move to the cloud yet? Oh yeah, definitely. In fact, a lot of our customers today are buying what we call bricks. So we, we, we play on the word Rubrik, uh, our appliances we call bricks. Uh, we also sell our, our product as software that you can put on third-party hardware, um, you can run it on a virtual machine in a branch office or as a cluster of virtual machines in the cloud. 
Um, so we've got a, a few options for you in order to be able to suit all your needs. And then we have a SaaS platform called Polaris, which I talked about briefly during this talk, that allows you to manage all of that from one location and report on all of it from one location as well. So uh, definitely can handle you on-premises. We have customers who have one of our bricks, which is four nodes and 12 drives of maybe 30 terabytes to 120 terabytes. Uh, and uh, we've got customers who have 100 nodes of Rubrik, um, which is obviously gigantic. So, and it's the same technology, the same uh, appliances, it's just more of them. Very cool. Very cool. Next question they're asking, um, Seth is asking, and we may need to find out a little bit more detail on this, but uh, basically could the automation or scripting tool supported by Rubrik allow Rubrik or something else to monitor log data and then automatically execute a disaster recovery scenario? So in that case, we'd probably work with uh, another SIEM um, or another uh, automation product, something that's more suited to gathering and interpreting those uh, uh, those logs like a Splunk um, or uh, ServiceNow Security Incident Response, which I got to do an integration with a little while ago for, that was specific to ransomware. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, someplace where you can actually get those inputs and build that playbook, um, I think would be a better suited platform. We're not going to get those logs in directly, but we're, it's really easy for another platform to call our REST APIs to cause that recovery to happen. So we could it would definitely be a, a key player in that, uh, in that uh, multi, uh, multi-system play, if you will. Very nice. And then there's another question here. Can Rubrik back up SaaS storage applications, for example, things like Dropbox or OneDrive? So we do have support for OneDrive today. Um, we don't have support for Dropbox yet. Um, that's something where if, if you're interested in it, uh, you can definitely drop us a line and let us know um, uh, what your business needs are around that. We're always looking for new opportunities for applications that people need protected and to understand how quickly they need to have them protected. Um, some things we can do rapidly, some things take a little longer, um, but uh, yeah, we're always expanding to cover new applications and workloads for customers who need them. Excellent. Rodney's asking, you know, over time as your data protection infrastructure, you know, needs grow and it scales up and you purchase newer bricks to go to go with the older bricks in the infrastructure, is there at some point you're going to have compatibility issues or you just have to replace everything or how does that work as you scale up over time? It's actually really cool because we're coming to the end of life on our oldest bricks that we were selling um, a few years ago, the 300 series, and we've got a new 6000 series that's been out for a couple of years now. Um, and so this, basically the answer is don't really worry about it as long as your brick is supported. Um, the, the ability to coexist in that cluster will be there. So as you go from 300 to 6,000, from 6,000 to whatever's next, as long as the, the bricks that are in your cluster are supported, um, you won't have a problem. Um, and yes, you can take a 300 and a 6,000 and let them sit there running for as long as you need to in order to, to handle uh, your workloads. And then when it comes time to renew the, uh, the 300 series to a 6,000, or whatever's next, you renew that brick, you bring in the new brick, the data replicates across it, we decommission the old brick and you take it out of the system. And it's not a forklift upgrade, it's just kind of that continuous rolling upgrade capability. Um, which we also, by the way, have a, a, a licensing program called Rubrik Go, which allows you to do subscription licensing of our hardware like you've probably seen from some other vendors which comes with a guarantee as far as how much the renewal is gonna look like in three years and a hardware replacement when that uh, renewal comes due and it, it's paid. So some really cool opportunities to make it really easy to consume rubric in your uh, environment. Very cool, very cool. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time in today's event, but uh, Rich, this has been some fantastic discussion. I really enjoyed the best practices. We got tons of questions from the audience. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with the Actual Tech Media audience today. Thanks, David. And thanks again to everybody who attended. Really happy having you here. Of course, thank you to the audience out there as well for joining us. Don't forget to go to the handouts tab there, click on the rubric link, also the rubric build uh, website where you can learn about integrations and SDKs. Uh, so um, 
encourage you to look out in your email box for future uh, communications from Rubrik to learn more. And before we go, I want to announce the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card that's going to Chris Collins from Georgia. Congratulations, Chris Collins. And of course, thank you to everyone again for joining us. Hope that you learned a lot and have a great day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.